Welcome to the Christopher Hall Training Podcast where we're going to be talking about how do I strengthen my low back with no equipment. We're going to be covering it in three parts. We're going to talk about uh, the different areas of the body to focus on when we're exercising. We're going to talk about what exercises to do and we're going to be talking about why we need to do those exercises. If you are a beginner and you want to build your low back strength endurance, click the link in the description and go through to my how to build low back strength endurance 12 week online program, which is full of follow along workouts that progressively overload uh, the low back muscles that we're going to talk about in this tutorial to build your low back strength endurance. Part one is statically contract your mid back muscles. We're going to cover three muscles, longissimus, iliocostalis and latissimus dorsi. Now latissimus dorsi, dorsi technically isn't a mid back muscle because it kind of covers the whole of the back but um, the, 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 the same principle applies of how to use these muscles um, sort of hold between these three muscles albeit the first two are mid back muscles and the the latissimus dorsi is sort of a um, a whole back muscle, if you will. So, why do we need to statically contract them? Well, first of all, the spine, when it's in its neutral posture, is the the position of minimal load. Now, if you use neutral spine, a lot of people disagree that it's even a thing. Um, but there is a position of minimal load and it's that neutral spine position. Now, there is a range to it and that range is known as an e elastic equilibrium, which basically means the passive tissues that are around the spine have least strain going through them and that's optimised all the way around. So if you think about it this way, if you flex the spine forward, you have sort of a stress um, through the back of the spine and a slackness through the front. If you tilt to the right, then that strain goes that on the on the left and then you get slack on the right. So when you're in that neutral posture, that's when it's all sort of evenly distributed. So what that's able to do, that's able to spread load around. So when we are activating muscles and putting um, extra load on the spine, it's distributed more evenly around the torso. When we go into um, sort of flexed postures or m spine moving exercises that can concentrate stress on the spine and that can build up over weeks months and years along with everyday life that builds up and then that puts stress on the back and then eventually um, the back uh, fails in some way shape or form and you get an ache a pain or even uh, a an injury that comes out of it so when we statically contract we are distributing load across it or across the passive tissues and we are challenging and maximizing the muscles around it. So we're maximizing the muscles which we want and we're minimizing the stress on the passive tissues um, so, or, or that's optimized if you will or that's minimized. So that's why we, st why we statically contract. Now the three muscles longissimus, iliocostalis, latissimus dorsi. Why are, we, why are we statically contracting those? Well if you think about their anatomy Basically, the, mu the, the muscular part of the muscle, 90% of it is cover covering the rib cage. So the rib cage is the anchor for those muscles. It then comes off the bottom of the rib cage and it, it basically becomes its tendon once, it once the rib cage finishes. What that does is that basically holds and stabilizes the lower back. The only muscles that really are in the lower back area is multifidus that goes up through the lumbar vertebra and the um, uh, sort of the posture detecting muscles that go between the transverse processes and the spinous processes. But they are more posture recognition muscles. They aren't really movement muscles. So longissimus iliocostalis, latissimus dorsi, they basically anchor on the rib cage and on the shoulder and then stabilize the lower back. So they join into the thoracolumbar fascia, which also attaches into the five lumbar vertebra, and they stabilize. So the more strength endurance we can build into these three muscles, the more we will get out of the thoracolumbar fascia, and the more stability, strength, and endurance we will have within the spine. The exercise that's probably the most effective for that is 
the bird dog. You've also got um, a good morning, a deadlift, but with the good morning and the deadlift, well, they need to be weighted really, but you can do just a good morning, like a kneeling good morning, which will help stabilize the spine by activating those muscles because your body is hinging over and those muscles are activating. And because we're talking about no equipment, those are probably the two best exercises. The bird dog, in so much as we've got two hands on the floor, we lift one up, so all the muscles on this side with the arm lifted, they have to activate to hold your body up. If they didn't activate, your body would, would sort of uh, drop down. So we need to use those muscles in that way. How we get the latissimus dorsi activated is we come into this position, then we screw our shoulder down and you'll feel latissimus dorsi activate down there. So from beginner's perspective, that's where we start. So we would start with bird dog and good morning. And those are the reasons that we would use. Part two is activating your glutes. Now we activate the glutes for two reasons. One, because again, they help, they help stabilize the pelvis. And the pelvis is what the low back sits on. So you can have a stable lumbar spine, but if your pelvis is unstable, then there's gonna be an inherent instability in the spine because it sits on an unstable surface, which is the pelvis. So we need to stabilize that area. What we also need to do in that area is we need to build the movement in the hips. So we get the glutes providing the movement or the hips providing the movement and the spine is able to stay in as stationary a position as possible. Now I'm gonna, when we get to part number four, I'm gonna add some caveats to that. But with regards to exercise and loading, we need to get our movement from the hips and we need to maintain posture through the spine. Exercises that we would use the most obvious one, certainly from the perspective of a beginner, is the bridge and the single leg bridge. We can also bring in what I would describe as like a bridge march. So basically we are on our shoulders, our hips are up, our knees are bent and our feet are on the floor. We would squeeze the glutes using the, um, uh, using the double leg bridge with both feet down. Then we would go into a marching scenario because then we've got one foot coming up and down, one foot coming up and down. Then we would go into a single leg bridge. So that will get the muscles activated. That will then help you stabilize the pelvis. We would then need to build some movement into that. And exercises to use for that is just very simple hip hinges. Um, and then when you get to the top of the movement, it would then be um, activating the glutes when you get there. So. They're very simple exercises. Now, why are we using these types of exercises? Well, when, again, you look at certainly glute maximus, it joins again into the thoracolumbar fascia or the lumbodorsal fascia. Now, along with the uh, mid-back muscles that join into it, what they are essentially doing when you activate them and tighten them, you are pulling. So you've got glute on the right pulling down, glute on the left pulling down, um, mid-back muscles Pull on the right pulling up and mid back muscles on the left pulling up. So basically you're pulling that taut. And what that's doing, not only the muscles from the mid back join into the lumbar spine, the thoracolumbar fascia joins into the lumbar spine and the glutes at the bottom join into the thoracolumbar fascia. With all of that area that's pulled taut, you have, let's just say maximum stability within the lumbar spine certainly from the perspective of um, the thoracolumbar fascia. We're gonna talk about the abdominal fascia in a second. Um, so what we are doing, we are pulling taut the whole area. We are using these muscles that we've talked about, so the five muscles that we've talked about, uh, longissimus, iliocostalis, latissimus dorsi, and both the glutes. We're using them to stabilize the area. Once we've stabilized the area and we've got the muscles active, as I've mentioned, we can then start building strength and endurance into them. And the more strength and endurance we can build into these muscles, the more we are gonna stabilize and strengthen that area. Although we aren't necessarily strengthening the area, we're strengthening it around it, 
but that provides strength and minimizes the load on the lower back because the, as I've mentioned already, the lumbar dorsal fascia minimizes load on the lower back. Maintaining the proper position minimizes load on the lower back. So we are getting maximum amount of the muscles whilst also providing minimal load to the lower back. And that's how we've got to think about not only rehabilitation, but also fitness and exercise, which we're talking about in this tutorial. Finally, with regards to exercise, we're talking about the abdominal wall as well. Now, I'm not talking about muscles, so I'm not talking about rectus abdominis or the obliques individually. I'm talking about the abdominal wall, which is all of that together. Now, what that provides is a solid cylinder to the area. So with the lumbar dorsal fascia on the back, when we pull all of that taut, we're stabilizing the, um, the lumbar spine. But when we can complete the circle, when we come all the way around, which is essentially where the abdominal fascia is, now the abdominal fascia and the lumbar dorsal fascia are basically the same tissue. It's just the abdominal fascia is on the front and the lumbar dorsal is on the back. But essentially it's the same thing. You've just got muscles that sit within it. Now what that's doing, that is basically completing the ring or the hoop around the torso. So you basically bring full stability when you have the glutes working the abdominal wall working and the mid back muscles working that is you, you're then able to generate higher amounts of intra abdominal pressure which is a force that goes outwards to neutralize the force that's going outwards you activate the muscles to hold everything in and that is essentially your core strength and stability which will then bring low back strength to your lower back so if we've got the whole cylinder working, the whole hoop working, we get a much more effective intra-abdominal pressure being evenly pressed, pressed out. What that then does, that allows us to create hoop stresses all the way around the torso, so we are basically able to hold that in place. So exercises that we would use for that, side plank and plank. Two very simple exercises, but certainly from the perspective of a beginner, all of these exercises that I've talked about, including plank and side plank, are there first of all to get you engaged in the muscles that are working. So can you feel your glutes when you do the bridge? Can you feel your lats when you do the bird dog? Can you feel your obliques or the lateral musculature when you do the side plank? Can you feel the rectus abdominis when you do the uh, plank? What you can then do is move into a plank with an arm raise because what we need to be able to do is integrate all these muscles together when we do a plank and lift an arm up we integrate the low back muscles we integrate uh, sorry the mid back muscles and we integrate the hip muscles when we then swap sides when we put one arm down and lift the other arm up we are changing the activity between right when we lift the right arm up then it goes down and left when we lift the left arm up. So we've got this interplay of activity, so we're moving the stress and the tension around the torso, which is what the torso wants. It wants to be able to do that. It wants to be able to manage that. You can then do a, a side plank with a leg raise, because the side plank with a leg raise will activate not only the lateral musculature, the obliques, even the lats. It will activate when we lift the leg up and make the bottom leg work on its own, it will make the um, uh, glute medius, glute minimus start working. So that's another effective exercise for when it comes to integrating all these muscles together to create that one solid cylinder to be able to create the intra-abdominal pressure and then therefore the hoop stresses to hold everything in. Then we could take it a step further and go from a plank up into a side plank. So we're moving, we're lifting an arm up and then we're rolling up into a side plank. So we're moving it from the middle to the side, then we roll up and it goes to the other side. So we've got all these different um, ways and means of building the, the lower back by not really building the lower back. What we're building is everything that's around the lower back and then that is what stabilizes and strengthens the area because we're taking all the tension away from it. So we're, we're removing all the load and we're challenging all the muscles around it to hold everything in place. So that brings us to the end of, let's just say, 
the anatomy. What we're going to do in this final part four is just talk a little bit more about some caveats and context as to why we use um, or the differences between exercise and everyday life. And we do need to bring this context to it because when I talk about exercise and for the most part not moving the spine, we need to understand why that's being said because there are people that say we should move the spine, we need to make the spine strong in flexion and we need to make the spine strong in all different movements. Now, if you look at the literature, you will find that in when your spine is at full flexion and it's loaded, that is increasing its risk of injury. When you move the spine with higher loads, that is increasing its risk of injury. Now, the context that comes with that is the load. If you have zero load on the spine, so if you are doing, um, you are picking a pen up from the floor, you have license to bend down from your spine and pick that up because the load is so low that it's not really going to have a huge effect on it. If you have back pain and flexion is a trigger for your pain, then it's probably more effective to do it with a neutral spine. So you can see that if you've got a healthy spine, you can bend it much more than a person who's got an unhealthy spine that has trouble with lower back pain, inflection. So we need to understand it. And there's, there's a million and one different scenarios that would slightly change the, how we would use the body. But from that perspective, if you have a healthy spine, you have more license to move it when it's unloaded. If you have pain in the area, then you it would be more advisable not to flex it if your spine is triggered or if your pain is triggered with flexion. So there, there's context to why that's being said. So with regards to the exercise that I'm prescribing, the reason that it's being prescribed is we want to minimise the load we, or we don't want to put any unnecessary pressure on the passive tissues of the spine. We want to challenge the muscles. If we want to challenge the muscles, as I've described, we aren't really challenging any muscles in the lower back because there's only a few down there. There is quadratus lumborum. That is um, challenged in a side plank. That is challenged in a farmer's carry. So there are exercises for that. But again, it's not a, it's not a movement muscle. It's a static contraction muscle because it's there to stabilise. So with regards to the muscles that we want to be challenging or the areas that we want to be challenging, it wants to be around the lower back rather than of the lower back, if that makes sense. So that's why I've chosen these exercises. And it's good practice to start from the perspective of maintaining neutral spine. And then as the back becomes more conditioned, it then gives you the license to move away from that. And even if you've got such good back health, you could even lift with um, a, 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 a slightly rounded spine as long as the abdominals are braced. So again, there's context to it and there's reasons why you can and why you can't. I wouldn't necessarily go into a gym and lift a deadlift, a 100 kilo deadlift with a rounded spine um, or doing your one rep max with a rounded spine. That's going to cause you a problem. But if it was 10 kilos or 20 kilos, which is, I don't know, 20% of your one rep max, let's say, then it's probably not going to be too much of a problem. But again, that depends on the health of the spine, which we need to understand. So I could go on on those scenarios uh, for a long time because there are a million and one of them, as I described. But for now, from the perspective of a beginners that wants to build their low back strength endurance, number one is statically contract the mid-back muscles. Two is activate the glutes. And three is build the abdominal wall as well. Try and maintain the, the neutral spine to be able to minimize the load on the lower back whilst maintaining as uh, like maximal activity at those muscles. So many thanks for watching. My name is Chris from Christopher Training. I'll speak to you in the next episode.